Thank you for joining us online today. You're about to hear a message from our senior pastor, Pastor Dave Minton. If God has used this ministry to bless you in any way, please take a few moments and send us an email at info at go to ccc.org. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this ministry to bless and inspire faith in people all over the world through what he's doing right here in the Pacific Northwest. Also, if you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do that by giving online as well. It helps us to continue to bring broadcasts like this one every single week. So now, prepare your heart to hear a message from God. A summer series called Seven Decisions of History Makers. And we're looking at seven biblical characters who made decisions that changed the direction and the course of their life and allowed them to become history makers. So we're looking at their decisions, at the decisions that we can make. Now, when we talk about being a history maker, we're not talking about being famous, we're talking about being better. Anybody wanna be better? So we're talking about being better. And these decisions are the decisions that will add value to your life so that you can in turn add value to the life of other people. Most people wanna add value to somebody else's life but you have to understand you have to have something first before you can give it away. So you, you've got to have peace to give peace away. You, you've got to have wisdom to give wisdom away. You, you've got to have joy to give joy away. You've got to have something to give something away. And so these decisions that we're talking about are the decisions to add more value to your life that makes your life better, my life better. And in the making of that decision of having value in our life, now we can add value to other people's lives. Is this all right? See, see this is why it's so critical that if you want to help your children grow as a person, if you want to strengthen your marriage and help your spouse grow as a person, it all starts with your growth so the value you can add in other people's lives. And... <laughs> Throughout my life, I've heard this phrase, and I've mentioned it last week. I'll mention it this week. Pastor, you changed my life. And while that's very flattering, and I love to hear that, and it, and it strokes my ego, the reality is that's not true. Uh, the reality is that's not true. I shared some information with people. The decisions that they made changed their life. Because think about it. If, if, if I could change people's lives, I would do it more often. <laughs> I change you in Jesus' name. And some of you right now, you're thinking of some people. It's like, I would change some people right now. I change you in Jesus' name. I change you in Jesus' name. You, you can't change people. What you can do is present information to them. Then they make decisions. The decisions that they make is what changes their life. So if your life is going to change, if my life is going to change, it's going to start with the decisions that I make. And thus, that's why it's about making history. While we call being history makers, we're really talking about the future because today will turn into tomorrow, but it will also turn into yesterday. So if I make a decision today, it will influence my tomorrow, but it will also become my yesterday. So the decisions today will become my yesterday, which will make history in my future. I know that was really confusing and don't ask me to repeat it. But today will not stay with us much longer. So the decisions that we make today will become our history. But the decisions we make today will also become our future. Is this making sense to anybody? So, so here's the foundational verse that we're looking at in this series. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 22. I love what it says here. Continue, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Please notice that my part is to work out my salvation. God's part is to work in me to do his will and good pleasure. The subject matter of this teaching is not the part of what God does. The subject matter of this teaching is my part. Notice, I have a part to work out. God's part is to work in. I have a part. God has a part. Now, as a pastor, I know that certain subject matter gets people really excited. The subject matter that gets people really excited is when we talk about what God's part is. How God's got a promise for you. How God's got a future for you. How God's got a destiny for you. How God's got a plan for you. How God loves you. How God cares about you. How God went to prepare a place for you. How God's got an anointing for you. How God's got a breakthrough for you. How God's got a victory for you. 
And, and we all like that, right? Nothing wrong with God's part. The only problem is we don't have to worry about God doing his part. Are you tracking with me, church? And the only part we ever struggle with is our part. And so this subject matter uh, can be heavy at times because it deals with, will I make decisions? And sometimes if we're not careful, we'll beat ourselves up, we'll condemn ourselves, we'll judge ourselves, and we'll miss the power of this teaching, which is take responsibility and make a decision. It's not going to help you if you feel sorry for yourself. It's not going to help you if you languish in guilt. It's not going to help you if you languish in self-pity. So it's critical that you understand that the subject matter can be challenging, but it can also, if you, if you embrace it, can be very liberating. Because here's what we know. God's good for his part. We do not have to worry about God doing his part. The only problem we have to worry about is, will I do my part? Is this all right, guys? So let's get into this. Decision number two. We covered number one last week, but decision number two. Solomon, the decision to choose to seek wisdom. The decision to choose to seek wisdom. The Bible says here in 1 Chronicles, this is, this is when Solomon, let me give you the backdrop of this. He had just become king. He had been inaugurated king and made this incredible sacrifice of devotion to God and worship to God. And in the night he had a dream. And God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask whatever you want me to give you, what would, you, what would you do if God asked you that question? If, you, if, if God were to show up and say, what do you want? Now, I really want you to think about that. What do you want? What would you say? Would it be money? Would it be a career? Would it be a house? Would it be health? Nothing wrong with any of those things. But they might not be the most important thing. Here's what Solomon answered. You have been very kind to my father David and you have made me king in his place. Now, Lord, God, may your promise to my father David come true. You have made me king of a people who are as many as the dust of the earth. Now give me wisdom and knowledge so I can lead these people in the right way because no one can rule them without your help. God said to Solomon, you have not asked for wealth or riches or honor or the death of your enemies or for long life. But since you have asked for wisdom and knowledge to lead my people over whom I've made you king, I will give you wisdom and knowledge, but I will also give you what you didn't ask for, more wealth, more riches, and more honor than any king who has ever lived before you. That's powerful. Notice, by asking for the right thing, he got everything. Are you catching this? History makers, Solomon made the decision to choose to seek wisdom. Here's the thing. Wisdom is available to everybody. It's available to everybody. But it is only found by the diligent. Are you catching this? Wisdom cries out, the Bible says. Listen to me. Come to me. Discover me. The reality is most people don't choose wisdom. While it is available, it's not the choice that most people make. Solomon, right after he asked for this, please catch this, right after he asked for wisdom, he's given a problem to solve. Now let me ask you this. Does anybody got any problems to solve in their life? Does anybody face some decisions that you're going to need to make in a very near future? Have you ever been backed into a corner with tough choices you've got to make? Life-altering choices. Life uh, course-setting choices. Sooner or later, everybody gets in places where you've got to make tough decisions. And even the decision to not make a decision is a decision. Do you remember the guy who hid his talent because he was afraid to use it because he didn't want to lose it? That was a decision. It was a poor decision, but it was a decision to not decide, which sometimes becomes a poor decision. Are you catching this? So everybody has to make decisions. But here's what Solomon is doing. Before he starts making any decisions as king, his first decision was to ask for wisdom to make good decisions. Is that making any sense to anybody? It's like, God, before I do anything else in life, before I set the course of my life, before I make commitments in my life, 
before I move out in life. Give me wisdom to make good decisions. So Solomon, next morning, wakes up, and they bring this problem to him. And they, the problem was that these two women, they were prostitutes, and each of them had a child. And in the course of the night, one mother had slept on her child, and the child had died. And she took the dead child, one mother took the dead child and went over and exchanged it with the living child and put her dead child with the other mother and took the living child. Well, when the mother of the living child woke up, she recognized this is not my child. And they got into a big heated debate and an argument and that was brought to the king. And so the king's listening to this and the woman with the dead child who had taken the living child said, no, that's my child. And the woman with the dead child said, no, the living child is my child. And Solomon said, I know how we can figure this out. Bring me a sword, cut the child in two, give half to each. Now you can <laughs> Sounds like a man right there. Uh, separate the child, give half to each. The mother of the dead child who stole the living child said, that is a great answer. The mother of the living child whose child had been stolen, said, no, that's a terrible answer. Give her the child. Now watch this. Solomon said, no, don't harm the child. Give the child to the compassionate mother because that's the child's mother. Now, here's what I want you to understand, the beauty of that. That day, everybody in the kingdom knew they had a leader that they could rely on. They knew they had a leader that had wisdom. They knew they had a leader that had good judgment. What might happen if you went to the office this week and you made a wise choice? Might that open up the opportunity of promotion in your life? What might happen if you gathered your family together and you started saying, bringing forth a wise choice, all of a sudden something inside of it, it allows promotion to come into your life. Instead of demanding promotion, instead of demanding respect, sending demanding honor instead of demanding compliance promotion just come because wisdom was demonstrated are you catching this here's the thing guys wisdom is available to all of us it's available to me it's available to you throughout life you're going to get boxed into corners where you're going to have to make some choices before you make the choices that set the course of your life, make the choice to get wisdom first. I hope you can understand that phrase. Before you, and, and the reality is most people don't get wisdom before they make choices. Follow along. What is wisdom? What is wisdom? Wisdom, by definition, is the art of skillful decision making. You show me a wise person and I'll show you an artist. Let me say it again. You show me a wise person and I will show you an artist. An artist in making decisions. An artist in unlocking riddles. And an artist in figuring out problems. An artist of making, solving life's challenges. I was in um, uh, San Diego a few weeks back and um, uh, Kelly and I were walking along the water one evening and uh, there was this guy there and he was out on the... the um, the jetty there, and he was collecting rocks. He had a fence around it, and he would take these rocks, and he was stacking them up one rock on top of another rock. And he was getting these things up to five, six feet high. Here's the interesting thing. They were one rock on top of another rock. Some of those rocks were as, you know, were as big as you could lift. They had to be 100 pounds. Some of the rocks were as small as a quarter. And here's the interesting thing. Some of those rocks that were as small as a quarter had other rocks that were as much as 100 pounds on top of them. And he was artistically balancing the weight of those rocks as they stood up. And, and people were standing around taking pictures of him stacking rocks, then paying him money for those rocks. And then, then we walked by the next day, he had knocked them all down and started all over. Every day, he just start all over. What are you saying, Pastor. The guy was an artist. And because he was an artist, people were willing to take pictures and give him money because he had this ability to stack rocks. I don't know how you're catching this. 
I go by and I look at that whole big pile of rocks and I say, man, there's nothing here. But here's an artist who could arrange the order of those rocks and balance those weights. And it was awe-inspiring. And a crowd is standing around watching somebody stack rocks. Let me say it again. A crowd is standing around paying money to take pictures of someone who has the skill of stacking rocks up on top of each other without falling over. Right. (laughs) You know what? People would gather around you and I for our wisdom. And that's what... That's what God says. Choose wisdom. It's the art of skillful decision making. But here's the thing. Wisdom does not come automatically. You have to seek for it. You have to search for it. And so let me give you three building blocks. If you understand these building blocks, because they're precursors to get to wisdom. They're precursors to getting to wisdom. The first building block is called knowledge. Knowledge is the gathering of information. It's the gathering of facts. In other words, if I'm going to have wisdom in my life, I've got to gather information. I've got to be a gatherer of information. The fact that you're in church on a Sunday morning and versus just watching nothing of value on television, or you're, you're gathering information. You may hear something today. You're gathering information. So knowledge is the largest building block. Out of knowledge comes something that's a little bit smaller, and that's understanding. Your understanding will never exceed your knowledge base. Oh, please catch this. There are a lot of things in my life that I have a knowledge of, but I don't really understand them. I I have a knowledge of how to turn the radio on in my car, but I don't have an understanding of how the radio wave gets there. There, there, There's some things I have a knowledge of, of how to use my computer, but I don't really understand the internet. There are, there are, I understand, I have the knowledge of how to turn on the light switch, but I don't understand electricity. And should I have to wire my house, we'd have a real problem. <laughs> Do you understand? So, so knowledge is the gathering information. Understanding is the interpretation of that information that you're gathering. And you always have to have more knowledge than what you understand. I hope that makes sense. How many know men and women are different? And brothers, unless you get a lot of information, you'll never understand your spouse. It doesn't come automatically. She doesn't think like you. She's not like you. She's different from you. And you, you got to gather some information if you want to understand her. Hello, somebody. That's really good. Pre- and ladies, you already know. You already know he is not like another woman. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's just different. And you're going to have to gather some knowledge if you want to understand him. Please catch this. But now watch this. Knowledge is the gathering information. Understanding is the interpretation of that information. And wisdom is the application which is smaller. Wisdom is the application of what you understand. Wisdom is the application of what you understand. Wisdom is not what you know. Wisdom is what you do. Boy, I hope you're catching that. Please don't think a person is wise by what they know. There's a lot of people who are going through divorce because they knew that adultery could destroy their marriage but chose it anyway. There's a lot of people who've got clean and sober and know that if I start one drink, it's going to lead to many drinks, but chose to pick up that drink again. They knew that if I have one, it won't stop at one, but I'm going to deceive myself. And all of a sudden now they're back in full-blown addiction. Are you catching this? There are people who get their finances, start moving in the right direction. No, if I go to the mall, if I, if I pull out my credit card and I use this credit card, I'm going to get myself in trouble again. I know that I don't have the money for this, so you, you know something, but you choose the opposite. So wisdom is not what you know. Wisdom is what you choose. There are people in prison who knew better, right? Some of you look at your children and you talk to your children. I've told you. And so it's not what you know. Wisdom is what you choose. And it's the art 
of skillful decision making. Now, in Luke, it's an incredible story. Um, Jesus is being criticized one day. And people, people are criticizing. Now, now, now watch this. When we're talking about wisdom, it's not about popularity. Remember, the decisions we're talking about isn't about being popular. It's about being better. And, and you're going to have to decide when it comes to wisdom how you're going to approach life. So Jesus is being criticized one day because people didn't like him. And he, and he makes this statement. He says, John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he has a demon. We don't like what you're doing. Now, John's having an effective life, but others don't like it. Then he a man comes and says, he's eating and drinking. And you say, look, he's a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I don't know if you're catching this. John's living one way, and they're critical of John. Jesus is living one way, and they're critical of Jesus. But then he makes this powerful statement. But wisdom is justified by her children. Now, simply what that means is that every time you make an important decision, it follows you around for a long time. Your decisions are like having children. Oh, I didn't need to think about that. <laughs> Your decisions are like children. And some of us, some of us, our children are more like Chucky. I don't know if you saw the, <laughs> don't. And some of us, we make choices and they just follow us around and they torment us. Their, their children, their decisions that you can almost say they're like a more demonic spawn. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, you say, I don't know. See, we make decisions in anger and that follows us around. We make a decision in bitterness, and it follows us around. We make a decision out of our hurt, and it follows us around. We make decisions out of our lust, and it follows us around. We make decisions out of our foolishness, and they follow us around. Because once a decision is made, then there has to become a season of managing that decision. And even though you might try to distance yourself from it, it just seems to keep showing back up in your life. Am I helping anybody? See, see wisdom is justified by her children. You know, and so in the context of your life, you know that you're making good decisions when you enjoy the fruit of your decisions. Let me say that again. You know you're making good decisions when you're enjoying the fruit of your decisions. Let me say it again. You know you're making good decisions when you get to enjoy the fruit of your decisions. As a pastor, I mean, I know there's a lot of people, you know, we come together as a family and people come from all kinds of different backgrounds and people have all kinds of opinions about what the church should be. And if the church is scratching their itch, they're okay. But should there be some kind of flavor, some kind of culture, some kind of style in their mind that is missing? Sometimes instead of saying a style that I would like is missing, because remember, they didn't like John's style. They didn't like Jesus' style. And sometimes if you give your life to the styles that others want of you, you can lose yourself. And Jesus is saying, John was never going to please you. I'm never going to please you, but John and I have children that follow us, decisions that follow us, that we enjoy the fruit of our decisions. What are you saying, Pastor? So people will sometimes say, well, this or that, and they have a complaint against the church. And again, I'm using the church because of the content of my life, the biggest portion of my life. You may be a business person. What's the biggest content of your life? In your marriage, what's the biggest? See, there are areas of your life that you want to make sure that you're making good decisions. So people say, like one example will be, well, they'll have a complaint. You're quenching the spirit because I come from a charismatic Pentecostal background. And they're saying, you're quenching the spirit, which means that we're not doing something they want to do. Anytime we're quenching something, it means they don't get to do what they want. Let me say that again. Anytime we're quenching something, it means we're not getting to do something they want. Better say that again. I just, I just feel like somebody needs to hear this because, see, you're, you're, you're complaining about me and not looking at you. You're quenching the spirit, which usually means you're not doing something that I want you to do. And it doesn't mean there's not room to change and grow and be better. And we'll talk about that later if we have time in this lesson today. But I decided a long time ago, the fruit that I want is our people being born again. And if people are being born again, 
and people are making a decision for Christ and people are following Christ, then I'm not quenching the spirit because that's the fruit I want. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Don't go and make my church people happy. <laughs> so I decided to give my life to Jesus and what he wants and then give my life to religious people and what they want. And I would rather be criticized by religious people for not giving them what they want, but be say, well done, thou good and faithful son for giving Jesus what he wants. And I'm okay with the criticism that comes from one so that I can get the praise that comes from another. That's wisdom. And if you don't know that in the context of your life, you can give your life to the wrong things and get the praise of the wrong things so that you get the criticism of the one that would really matter. That right there was really good. I'm just... I know some of you are like chewing on that like steak right now. That is like really good. But if you don't know what matters and you don't know who it matters to, you don't have the compass. you got to have knowledge, to have understanding, to have wisdom so that you can make good, skillful, artful choices. And those choices are going to follow you around. <laughs> Today is the anniversary day of the date I asked Kelly to marry me. as a great decision in my life right there. But I asked wisdom. It's a true story. I told Kelly, I said, I can't ask you to marry me until we have an argument. Because I know we know how to get along when we're happy. I just want to know how can we get along when we fight. She went out. We never did get in a fight. So I said, I can't, I can't wait. Anyway. <laughs> but it's a good decision. I see that decision follows me. See, there are big decisions in our life. They follow us around. Big de the day I just said yes to Jesus is a decision that's been following me. The day I said yes to starting and planting Capital Christian Center is a decision that's been following me around. Is this helping anybody? So how do we gain wisdom? Let me go through as many of these as I can. I got several thoughts for you today. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but how do we gain wisdom? Number one, ask for it. How do we gain wisdom? By asking for it. Listen to what James chapter 1 says. Verse 5 says, if, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God. Everybody say, you should ask God. <laughs> if your children come looking for wisdom from you, I'll give you my advice, but you, you should ask God. Somebody come and make a decision about your career. I'll give you my advice, but you should ask God. Somebody make a decision about their career or ministry or or relationships. I'll give you my advice, but, but you should ask God. We should always point people back to asking God for his wisdom. But you should ask God who gives generously, generously to all without finding fault, and he will be, it will be given to you. But when you ask, please catch this, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double minded, unstable in all they do. Are you catching what scripture is saying here? It says if we want wisdom, we should ask for it. And here's the thing with, with a lot of people. A lot of people say, I know I need wisdom. I'm asking for wisdom. But what they don't do is they don't ask for it in faith. That's the second part of this challenge here. When you ask for wisdom, you must ask for it in faith because if you don't ask for it in faith, the Bible says you are double-minded, unstable, and you will not receive anything from the Lord. So here's the question. When you ask for wisdom, do you ask with expectation? See, a lot of people, I need wisdom, I need wisdom, I need wisdom, but they don't really expect to get wisdom. Usually, I need wisdom is more of a complaint that I don't know what to do. Asking for wisdom from God should come with expectation that God's going to give you wisdom. So God, I'm asking for wisdom. I'm expecting you to give me wisdom. So now I have to know how to look for wisdom because if I've asked for it, he's going to give it because the Bible says if, if, if we know how to give good things to our children, how much more will your heavenly father give even better things to us if we ask him? Are you catching this? So one of the ways that God gives us wisdom is by putting information in our hands. Maybe it's a book. Maybe it's a CD. Maybe it's coming to church and you'll hear the ministry of the word. God gives you wisdom. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how often when you're really seeking God for wisdom and you come to church and you hear something? Isn't it amazing how often you hear relevant information when you're looking for it? 
You should learn to expect that. God, today I'm looking for wisdom. I'm asking you for wisdom. So now, God, let my ears and my eyes be open to where it might come from, the information that might come through the wisdom. Sometimes it comes through a relationship. Are you catching this? Let me just back up. Years ago, years ago, uh, we're, we're a small church, and I'm sitting in the car with a pastor uh, of a very large church, and he put a book in my hand. That book changed my life. That book gave me the, because I'm trying to figure this thing out. I'm trying to pastor this church. I did not come from a ministry family. My father was not in ministry. Uh, I, I wasn't inheriting ministry. I'd been in church, but I didn't, I didn't understand church leadership. I didn't understand building teams. I didn't understand developing people. I didn't understand casting vision. I didn't understand. I didn't understand anything. I just loved Jesus without a plan, without a clue. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You fall in love with Jesus. Like, okay, I love you, Jesus, but I don't know what I'm doing. And this guy's encouraging me, but we only had a couple minutes and he gave me a book. And that book so articulated everything that was in my heart. I was trying, I was trying to discuss and trying to innovate and trying to make sense of and, 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 and here it is. Oh man, I started giving everybody that book. Read this book and let's talk about this book. And all of a sudden we just, we started taking off as a church because somebody put information in my hand that we absorbed and came understanding of it. Earlier this year, we're talking about where we're going as a church. And if you were here, we did the Soak series. And in the Soak series, we're always telling you, take time to seek God and find out what he wants for your life that coming year. And this last year, I felt like God really spoke strongly to my heart. He says, don't think about the next year. Think about the next 25 years. I want you to really think about the next transition season of your life and where I want this church to be in 25 years from now. And there were things that I felt God was asking me to do. I have a clue how to do yet. Now, I got 25 years experience and God took me from a place of where I would have experience to a place where I was a novice again. And there were things he was asking me to do. I said, God, I don't know how to do that, but I know how to ask for wisdom. So I said, God, I'm asking for wisdom. One of the things I felt like God was asking me to do was start planting churches like crazy. I felt God, I, I felt God saying, I'm going to start giving you people. I'm going to start giving you people who have a heart for ministry. I'm going to give you people who have a heart to plant churches. And I want you to develop them. And I want you to grow them. And I want you to use them, and I want you to pastor them as they start planting these churches. And so I said, God, okay, I'm in, God. But I started finding out years ago there are very few people like me because I'm just stubborn, hard-headed. I'll figure it out. But most everybody else needs a plan. And I said, God, I, wanna, I, wanna, I need a plan, God. I need a plan, God. So I started looking at ways to do this. This is a long story, but it's a good story. I started looking for ways to do this. I started looking for ways to do this, and I, I found a way to do this. I found Studied different groups, started different organizations, studied different ministries that were doing this. And I found one, but I did not know anybody in that organization because I always believed that God will also give you wisdom by giving you a relationship. So I said, God, I believe I have a model, but I don't have a relationship to help me interpret the model. So, God, I'm asking for a relationship. Recently, I was out of town at a conference, and they picked me up at the hotel. As I'm getting the hotel to, in the van to go to the conference, we stopped by this other hotel and picked up this other person. And as I began to talk to this person, they had this massive ministry. I didn't know them, but they had this massive ministry. I've talked to them, and, and, and they're doing what's in my heart. Got all these churches planted, and got, I mean, they got, I mean, most of their churches that they have planted are over 2,000 people. And they're just doing all of this stuff. And then I started asking, and then he started asking me some questions. And, and he's a part of the founding crew that created the model that I asked God to give me a relationship to. Oh, you, you're not. Because I knew the model, but I needed to understand the heart of the model. And when I was talking to him, I understood, oh, that's, that's my pulse. That's my heartbeat. Okay, it, it, God, I've got, now I've got the relationship. Are you catching what I'm trying to say? When you ask for wisdom, you've got to ask with expectation that God's going to provide it. So he can provide it with information knowledge, books, CDs. He can also provide it with a relationship, but he also can provide it by divine inspiration. Does that make sense? The Bible says in Corinthians, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them. But what does he say? He says he has revealed them to us by his spirit. In other words, there are things that you will only know by God's revelation. And, and so God brings you information, God brings you relationship, but he also brings divine revelation. Um, years ago, um, in my first marriage, when my wife was struggling with bipolar, um, 
there was a there was a season in my life where it was really painful for me, and uh, I was really focused on how it was affecting me. I was feeling rejected. I was feeling like a failure. I wanted to pray that she would be healed. Yeah, I can go on and on down the list of litany of all of the things in my life of how her, her sickness was affecting me. I'm, I might be the only one that does that. Usually if somebody else has bad behavior, you talk about how it affects you. So I'm going through how it's affected me, the shame I felt, the embarrassment I felt. The last thing I wanted to be at that season of my life was a public person. I wanted to go find a rock to hide under. I just wanted to be as small as I could be and in my shame and embarrassment. God asked me something as I'm praying about how it would affect me in this divine revelation. He asked me, will you love my daughter for me? Will you love my daughter for me? And that freed me. No longer was it about how it affected me. It was about God loving his daughter and wanting to demonstrate his grace to his daughter and let her know the love of God because in her struggle and in her bad behavior, the rejection that she had on herself as, as well. About a year later, she took her own life and committed suicide. The reason I tell you that is I tell you today how grateful I am that I am not full of a bunch of regrets of living about how her bad behavior was affecting me because today I don't know that I'd be able to overcome the regret. The wisdom of that prayer and the wisdom that God brought to me by divine revelation, because I didn't know the future, but God had a plan. If In my obedience, he had a plan for me. In my understanding, his grace, there was a plan for me. I hope I'm helping somebody. See, some of you might be in a place right now it doesn't make any sense. And God says, I want to give you wisdom by divine revelation that will help set your course. It will get you through this season. See, wisdom does not, listen carefully, wisdom does not cause you to miss the storm. Wisdom helps you to navigate the storm. See, the storms come. Wisdom just gives you the ability to navigate them. I'm out of time, but write these others down so you can meditate on them. Number one, wisdom comes by reading. When you read on, wisdom says, write on. Remember the phrase, write on. So when you read on, wisdom says, write on. And I'm not going to get through all the notes in this. So you can take your bulletin or go to the website and pull down all the notes and all the scriptures. There's a lot more there. But if you were to take a sixth grader, and that sixth grader only read two books a year, that sixth grader would be behind. They would be considered slow or underdeveloped because they would not be keeping pace with the educational process. So a sixth grader who reads two books would be considered slow. Do you know what we call the adult who reads two books a year? Normal. There are people who have pride in saying, I haven't read a book since I got out of school. Please don't tell us that. The Bible says even a fool can appear smart if he doesn't talk. <laughs> that is not something you should ever brag about. Because a wise person looks at you and says, there's no wisdom here. There's no wisdom here. I'm, yeah, if I'm slapping you on the face, that's okay. I love you, and I'm trying to help you, and I'm trying to make you make better decisions. You want to see your finances? Read on it. You want to see health? Read on it. Relationships? Read on it. Leadership? Read on it read on it. Parenting, read on it. Read on it. And this wisdom says, write on. Read on. Write on. The most important thing you can read on, there's a lot of things I like to read on. Read on this. You need to fall in love with this. Some of this book sets on our table at home and says, come find me. I'm in here. Wisdom is in here. If you love this book, you love wisdom. Let me say it again. If you love this book, you love wisdom. And if you'll read this book, you'll find wisdom. Wisdom will start speaking to you. And wisdom will start talking to you. Number three is choose the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not terror. The fear of the Lord is to protect you from harm. So in other words, <laughs> I really wish I had time to teach this, but there's a lot of things I'm afraid of because of this book. When I was single, I was afraid to not date someone. 
that loved God that was in God's house. I w- if you were single, I'd be afraid. I would be afraid to even date someone, to, to play with your emotions, for your heart to get moving in a direction. I'm going to go, I'm going to love this person. I'm going to get them, I'm going to get them to serve God. You're deceiving yourself. Be afraid. I'd be afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid not to tithe. I'm not trying to beat anybody. But literally, I am afraid not to tithe. I tithe on unemployment. I, I've tithed my whole life. I am afraid not to tithe. Now that bring, because I tithe, I have a lot of peace. Hold on. I, I, I'm afraid. This is for me. I'm afraid to go to bed with bitterness, unforgiveness. I'm afraid that I'm going to give place to the devil. I'm going to sabotage my heart and my life and my relationships. I'm afraid to go to bed with the sun going down on my wrath. I'm, I, I'd be afraid to make a decision that took me out of a Sabbath day of worshiping God with my career. I don't care what the career would be. There's times in my life before I even got into ministry, decisions I've made. You've heard me tell the story about how I gave up football. I gave up the following and the pursuit of football so I could be in God's house. I'm so glad I'm not a football fan and lost my destiny because I couldn't make a decision to give up watching somebody else live their life because I couldn't make a decision to live my own. I, 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 would, I would be afraid not to persevere because the scripture says that, that uh, be not weary and well-doing for you'll reap in due season. I'd be afraid that if I quit, I'd be, like, I'd be an inch from my breakthrough. I think people stop all the time just short of their breakthroughs. I'd be afraid not to keep going. I'd be afraid to give up. I'd be, I'd be afraid. I'm afraid not to give my best because I know that whatever I do, I do it as unto the Lord, not unto people, and I do it unto the Lord and say, God, I want to try to give my best in what I do. And here's the thing. I'm afraid to be afraid. You remember the guy with the one talent? And he said, I was afraid of you, so I hid your talent. And the Lord says, that was a bad choice right there. So I'm afraid not to use what God gives me. I'm afraid not to step out in faith. I'm afraid to step out in faith, but I'm more afraid not to step out in faith because I, 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 I'm more afraid of God disappointment than stepping out like Peter did and sink and have God help me, have him correcting me. See, the fear of the Lord is a choice. It's not a terror. See, fear that is a terror paralyzes you from making a decision. Fear that is a choice. It says, no, I'm, I'm using it as a warning sign. It's my life. 